Hello and welcome to the PWSA USA virtual convention. Today is Friday, June 25th. This is our first session. Me and my friend Marguerite Krupnow are going to host this session. I'm are going to moderate this session. And uh, we have Casey Bedard, our speaker, with us today. Um, Casey is a board certified behavior analysis, international and international behavior analysis, um, specializing in treating behavior problems. Um, her research focuses on early intervention in childhood behavior and also in teenagers. Uh, Casey firmly believes that behavior analysis can create, can help create a brighter future for our children. So without further ado, I'm going to leave this um, with Casey Bedard and uh, enjoy your sessions. We have a live Q&A sessions at the end. Uh, we encourage you all to uh, start putting in your questions as we go. And also do not forget to do the survey at the end of the session. All right, Casey, it's all yours. You can unmute yourself, Casey. There we go. Sorry about that, Sarah. It was not letting me unmute myself. So I was a little bit stuck there. That's fine. So let me make sure. Can everybody hear me and see my slides? All right, I'll take that as a yes. Yes, we do. We do. <laughs> So thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Sarah, and I am absolutely delighted to be here presenting to you today. So I'm going to present some evidence-based methods for helping your children and adults through behavioral challenges. There's been very little research into ABA strategies that are specific for PWS, uh, which is something that we're trying to change with some of the research that I'm doing right now with the Chicago School and with PWSA. However, in my clinical practice, I work exclusively with children and adults with PWS, and the strategies that I'm going to present to you today have shown incredible success with my clients. So I'm sure you've all at some point read all of the terrible things that are on the internet, and you've seen the long list of behavioral challenges associated with PWS. Some of these you may already be experiencing with your, uh, your own child or adult. Um, although food stealing and hyperphagia are always at the top of the list of concerns, kids often struggle with tantrums, rigidity and resistance to change, repetitive behaviors such as repetitive asking and telling and repetitive play, trouble with transitioning, skin picking, and in some circumstances, other behaviors such as aggression and self-injury. So this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but it just goes to demonstrate the massive need for, for effective behavioral strategies for kids with PWS. So I gave this its own slide because I think it's important to highlight it, to underline it, and to possibly tattoo it on my forehead. Just because a behavior is on a PWS website or on the internet does not mean it's going to happen to your child. I don't want anyone losing sleep over any of the behaviors that they're not seeing. So even if your child is already experiencing some of these struggles, there's always something you can do. I have so many parents come to me and tell me that they've been told over and over again that there's nothing that they can do to help their child with a behavioral challenge. And I'm here to tell you that is absolutely incorrect. All the behavior that we see, both adaptive and otherwise, is a product of the interactions between biology and the environment. So even if your child might be at increased risk of having behavioral challenges because of their diagnosis, there are always skills that we can teach and environmental changes that we can make to help them better handle the struggles that PWS throws at them. So let's back up for just a minute. What is applied behavior analysis? And another question I often get is, isn't ABA just for autism? So ABA is simply the science of behavior Behavior analysts uh, believe that all behavior happens for a reason, and that if you can figure out the reason, then you can help with the behavior. 
And I always joke that behavior analysis works with your kids, it works with your dog, it works with your spouse, it works with your boss. Any problem that you can think of, if you get the science of behavior analysis right, you can help with those changes. So ABA um, helps us to understand the laws of behavior, the why of behavior, which is also referred to as the function, how behavior interacts with the environment and also how learning takes place. So your child is expected to succeed in a society that is often lacking in willingness to accept neurologically diverse individuals and also to support neurologically diverse individuals. And the society often requires a specific set of skills that because of PWS, your child may not have. So while we have to continue to fight for a more inclusive and accepting world, we also have to do our best to teach kids the skills that they need to have a, an easier and a, and a more enjoyable life. So ABA focuses on giving children and adults the skills they need to succeed. This includes things like communication, social skills, self-advocacy, um, life skills, play skills, and then other things like, like uh, basic skills like potty training. So as much as I would like to cover all these topics today, I can't quite talk that fast. So I'm going to focus on four strategies that I think can actually make a meaningful difference in your daily life. So first, I'd like to challenge you um, to think about your child's behavior in a different way. So instead of thinking about challenging behavior, I want to consider a behavioral challenge. So the term challenging behavior or problem behavior or maladaptive behavior often pits the child against the parent um, and puts the blame on the child for, for the, the way the behavior is occurring. So the behavioral challenges that are experienced by individuals with PWS are directly related to differences in cognitive function due to their biology and their brain structure because of the Prader-Willi syndrome. So challenging behavior is almost always an attempt to communicate something. For example, kids might be trying to, to communicate something like my hand is tired because I've been holding this pencil the whole day at school, or I'm struggling to understand this, or I can't get my brain to switch from this task to that, that task right now, even though you're asking me to. So even behavior that appears to be oppositional or defiant um, is most often linked to some type of skill deficit, whether that's an inability to wait or an inability to transition or to communicate, it's almost always linked in some way. So it's our responsibility to teach kids either to learn how to communicate in a more appropriate way, which is what we call functional communication, or to learn the skills they need to handle the task, the change, or the situation that they're resisting. So the challenge is, next time your child has a problem behavior, take a step back and consider what they might be struggling with or consider what skill they might be missing that's resulting in this issue. I'm abso not, absolutely not saying give into the tantrum because um, that's just going to per perpetuate the issue, but rather consider the skill that your child might be struggling with that resulted in the tantrum in the first place so that we can look at how we can support them going forward. So before getting started with the strategies, I just like to note that uh, when we're intervening with a behavior, we always have to consider the medical causes first. So if you even have the tiniest inclination that your child's behavior might have a medical issue, make sure you get that checked out first before you look into implementing any behavior change procedures. So this slide just gives some general guidelines to help keep expectations clear and fair for your child as you start implementing the behavioral strategies. First, always say what you mean and always mean what you say. Don't make promises that you can't keep and don't set limits that you, you don't think that you can follow through on. Although like tricking your child into something might feel easier in the moment, it doesn't really teach anything and it ends up just undermining your child's trust in you. Kids with PWS have an absolutely incredible memory. So if you trick them into something once, that's something they're gonna remember for, their, for the rest of their lives. Set rules, especially surrounding food security and stick to them as consistently as you possibly can. So there are a large set of food related skills that are appropriate to teach depending on a person's age and their level of hyperphagia. So I'm not by any means saying just lock the kitchen and never let your child around food. Um, but having clear rules and boundaries around food is essential from an early age. 
Older children find it extremely unfair if parents slap a whole bunch of restrictions on them as soon as they start to uh, struggle with hyperphagia, and it can make an already stressful time even more stressful. So just set some basic guidelines early that you can build off of to help develop responsible behavior around food as your child grows up. So ambiguity surrounding anything, whether that's food or an outing in the community or changes in routine, can all predispose tantrums. So set the expectations for outings in, in advance or for changes in, in advance. Um, for example, let your child know what and when they can eat if you're going to a family barbecue, or if you're taking them to the dollar store, what, how many things are they allowed, allowed to buy? Uh, what are the expectations for behavior when we go to the zoo? Make sure there's no ambiguity about what you expect um, and no ambiguity about what they can and cannot have, because oftentimes if they have a picture in their head of how things are going to go and that gets, uh, that gets uh, disappointed, that can predispose a, a problem behavior. So try to tell your child what you do want them to do and not what you don't want them to do. Saying don't do something leaves a lot of ambiguity as far as what the ex actual expectation is and doesn't leave you any room to praise the appropriate behavior. So instead of saying, don't touch that, you could say like, fold your hands, please, or put your hands on the table, please. And then if your child listens, you have the opportunity to praise that, to praise that appropriate behavior instead of getting sucked into scolding or having a power struggle or something along those lines. So finally, rehearsing new skills and new rout routines can be a game changer for your child. As I just discussed, like knowing what to expect in, a, in advance is really important. And then having those skills for your child, having those skills in their repertoire uh, is very helpful during, during stressful situations like schedule change. So there's nothing wrong with going back and practicing what you could have done differently if there's a behavioral problem or what you could do in the future. Like for example, if it's the first day of, of summer camp and your, your like, child had a tantrum in the morning or lost it on the way to summer camp, you can go back and practice what they could, what they could do differently so that they know what's the expected of them um, and they have some skills for the future. This also goes for, for like me as a practitioner or for um, people as parents. If you had planned to use a strategy but you forgot or you got stressed out in the moment and you didn't quite do it right, there's no reason you can't back, go back and role play that with your child and just practice the situation. That, that means that you and your child both know what the, the plan is for the future if that issue is to come up again. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to transitions. So we often hear of children with PWS being oppositional or rigid. Um, in other words, refusing to engage in tasks that they're being told to do or refusing to transition or otherwise being very uh, insistent on a specific routine or things being done in a very specific way. So when you have a very strong preference for routine and sameness combined with slow processing speed, task refusal and difficulty with transitions can occur. To make matters worse, individuals with PWS often have a poor concept of time. If you tell them they have five more minutes to play, they might play for another hour without realizing that five minutes haven't passed. And if you tell them that you're going on a plane to see Dr. Miller next week, chances are they're gonna pack their bag and they're gonna sit next to the door for the whole week, no matter how many times you explain to them that it's a whole week before you're going to get on the plane. So refuses to transition or to start tasks are often related to two different things, either an insufficient motivation to do so or difficulty with processing the change. When children fail to transition or to start tasks quickly enough, they're often scolded or prompted a whole bunch of times, which further punishes the process of starting an already difficult transition. So if you already didn't wanna do it and then you don't do it quickly enough and you get scolded for that, that just reduces your motivation to start altogether. So how can we help kids with this? One really simple and really easy solution to implement is to use transition timers. So anytime you need your child to start a task, especially if you need them to transition from something fun, like playing to something not so fun, give them a five minute timer. So once you give that five minute timer, you also wanna to try to give a two minute warning and a 30 second warning, just so that the end of the timer is not a surprise. 
And then when your child transition, transitions successfully or starts the task successfully, even if in the beginning it takes a little longer than you would ideally want, provide really specific praise about what they did well. Um, so for example, you can, you can praise the transition, you can praise the paying attention to the timer, but make sure they know, they really know what it is that you felt that they did well. You can also use a timer to give your child a time limit for how long they have to do something. Because sometimes kids are not only sl slow to start things, but they're also slow to finish things. Um, in my experience, kids really love to race the timer. So if you say something like, all right, we got five minutes to put our shoes on, uh, let's race the timer. And you put them in a race against the timer, that can, can speed things up, finishing tasks up quite a bit. Eventually, we want kids to be able to, to time their own transitions. Um, it, that's a skill that they'll need in adulthood. So if your child is at an appropriate age where you feel like they could set their own timer, go ahead and, and encourage them to do so um, and allow them to do so. Of course, that's with the caveat that they can't be adding extra minutes if they want extra minutes to finish whatever the task is. And then for, um, for older kids, the digital timers work really well. The visual timers don't work so well for uh, for kids who aren't quite at that age yet. So there's plenty of different visual timers that work great. Um, you can email me and I can send you some of your favorite, some of my favorites if you have any interest. So now let's move on to polite ignoring, which is also in behavior analysis called planned ignoring. So sometimes if you don't have anything nice to say, it's better to say nothing at all. I'm sure that some of you, some of you have noticed when you tell your child, like, don't do that or don't touch that they either turn around and they grin at you um, or they just keep doing it more. So sometimes our attempts to stop behavior actually ends up increasing it. Pretty much anything that we, that we pay attention to, we can, uh, we can increase. And then also when you're, when you're four or five or six, getting somebody else worked up is a really good way to entertain yourself for 15 or 20 minutes. So we just have to be very careful what we apply our attention to. So there are two ways to use polite ignoring for minor inappropriate behaviors that aren't, they're not putting your child in danger, they're not hurting anybody else, they're not knocking anything over, or doing anything dangerous, and aren't really causing any major disruptions to anyone. You can simply pretend that you don't hear or see the behavior. And this I'm talking about for very minor things. Like for example, just picture a kid tapping a pen on a table. So yes, it's irritating, it's making you crazy, but it's not actually hurting anybody. My preferred method um, is what I call solve the situation without saying anything. So before you get sucked into raising your voice or getting in an argument or a power struggle, look at the situation and ask yourself, could I solve this situation without having to say anything? So if your child, for example, is banging a toy against the wall, um, they already know they haven't, they shouldn't be doing this. You've told them 20 times already. Is it better to, to get frustrated and to raise your voice or is it better to just pick the toy up and put it away until they're ready to play with it appropriately? If there's an argument going on at the dinner table, is it better to get involved in the argument and try to get everybody to settle down or to just move some chairs around and see if you can create some peace? So those are the types of situations that I'm talking about for this. So we have to remember that our children copy everything we do. So if you are like raising your voice and yelling and arguing, it you shouldn't be surprised that that's how your children also try to solve situations that's frustrating for them. Um, and so this, this strategy kind of works to avoid modeling that inappropriate behavior, but also can help you avoid getting sucked into arguments and power struggles that can then further escalate behavior. And I'm sure all of you have had the experience that if you argue with someone with PWS, you are gonna lose. So avoid that at all costs. So this strategy often works best in conjunction with rule setting. So if you've already clearly explained a rule um, to your child, if you then if you then see them violating the rule, there's there's no explanation needed if you go and change the environment. Like for example, if you told everyone like no standing up, the rule is no standing on the couch because it's dangerous and then you saw your child standing on the couch, you wouldn't need to go in and explain because you'd already done so and the rule was clear. So then you could just change the environment, relocate them to a different area without needing to give further explanation. So 
So now I'm going to move on to um, token economies. So just imagine like if your child struggles with difficulty tra with transitions, daytime sleepiness, low muscle tone, slow processing speed, impulse control, um, has difficulty engaging in some, some tasks, then doing these necessarily necessary tasks of learning in school and daily living and refraining from other tasks can require an inhuman effort. And many tasks are much more challenging and exhausting for kids with PWS and adults with PWS than they are for URI. So additionally, like they're often required to, to exert a lot more effort controlled to other people their age as a result of the need to um, to attend multiple therapies and to do that all in conjunction with the, the work or school that they're already doing. So while we should still have very high expectations, it's important to recognize the effort that people with PWS have to make in some way. Like I wanna make sure that, that inhuman effort that they're making gets recognized. So that brings me to token economies. So token economies are just systems of contingency management that are based on the systematic reinforcement of specific behavior. So tokens are earned and then exchanged for reinforcers. It's very simple. And the reason I love token economies uh, is because they teach a functional skill. So the entire economic, 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 economic system that we work on is a token economy. You go to work so that you can make money, so that you can spend your money on things that you either have to spend it on or want to spend it on. Dollars are just tokens. So if we use a token system appropriately, we can increase the motivation to, to engage in appropriate behavior and also teach functional money management skills. So also just a side note, um, you will probably see sweets in one of the final outcomes. I am not recommending sweets as reinforcers at all. This just happened to be on the visual. Um, so I just wanted to make note of that. So token economies can be used for pretty much any behavior you can think of. I have used token economies successful for everything from skin picking to helping kids remain on task at school, handling transitions, reducing tantrums. Um, Token economies work best in conjunction with teaching functionally equivalent responses. I can't touch on that today because I don't quite have enough time, but I will offer some resources on that um, at the end of the presentation. So token economies have four main parts. There are uh, the behaviors you wanna increase or decrease, the tokens themselves, the reinforcers, and then the token menu. So basically you want to choose two or three behaviors that you either want to see increased or decreased. I recommend focusing on increasing a behavior such as following directions or practicing calming strategies rather than decreasing a behavior because again, we want to be telling kids what we do want them to do and what we don't, not what we don't want them to do. Then you can either choose or create tokens. Uh, there are plenty of tokens that you can buy on Amazon or I have about a hundred templates for tokens and cute little dollars and things that I'd be happy to share. Next, you need to identify reinforcers. I recommend uh, staying away from actual items for the most part. Small things like stickers might be okay, but kids usually either earn so many that it ends up being cost prohibitive um, or they get bored with the, the items that are available on the menu fairly quickly. Like for example, if you have Legos on the menu, once you've bought three or four Legos, you're, you're kind of over it. So that keeps, a, it's a little bit difficult to, to keep exciting. So experiences are much cheaper and also much easier to keep exciting. Consider things like, uh, like watching a family movie together or uh, blowing bubbles. If you have like regular bubbles that they are able to access, but, um, but there's like a special glittery butter or, uh, bubbles or something they want to play with. Um, Doing crafts from a special craft box, th those would be things that are a little more labor intensive for you, but are really worth it to your kids. And then creating something like a puzzle box or another toy box that your kid can earn access to rather than just earning puzzles, if that makes sense. There's also nothing wrong with using access to an iPad or watching a specific show. Uh, it, it, of course, if that's used in moderation and used with the availability of, of other reinforcers. So, be very careful not to bribe. 
So bribing means that you offer to give tokens after your child has already started acting up. For example, um, I'll give you three tokens if you can just stay calm until we get to the car. Uh, so this reinforces the bad behavior. So make sure that you always set the rules as far as how to earn, uh, how to earn reinforcement in, adv in advance. Like for example, if we have uh, good behavior on our trip to the zoo, then when you get home, you can earn three tokens. Or if you are able to do like uh, finish your morning routine and the time of the 15 minute timers and you can earn your tokens. Uh, so just uh, try to avoid that temptation to, to offer a reinforcer after your child has already run into issues because that's going to just reinforce the problem behavior itself. So if you already have a token system in place or if you decide to put one in, one in place, um, these are a couple of things to consider. Token systems and other forms of, of reinforcement pretty much always work if you can just get the details right. And the details, of course, are sometimes difficult to get right. So a couple of issues that people commonly run into is the reinforcers aren't strong enough. So, uh, so you have to sometimes be a little bit creative with helping your identifying children reinforcers for your children because they might say I want to earn this but if you see that they're not actually working for that it means it's not a strong enough reinforcer. Another issue can be that too much work is required to earn a reinforcer so if you're offering one token for an entire day of doing everything you're supposed to that might not be and you have to trade in three tokens to even get something that might not be strong enough to get your kids to work for that. Another issue could be that your child doesn't understand what's expected of them so if the rules are unclear, if the rules change, if the system is delivered inconsistently, those could all be reasons that, that your child's not responding to it. Um, and then if opportunities to earn tokens are too few and far between. So maybe you're asking your child to earn tokens for a behavior that they only have to do once a week. That might not be good enough to get buy into the system. Um, also, if tokens get taken away arbitrarily, that can sometimes take away from the system. And then also if your kid, is, if your child's not connecting the token to the reinforcer. So when we first start working with token systems, we probably have to be prompting our kids a lot to, to trade in their tokens so that they get the idea that like, oh, this little arbitrary token can actually get me something. So sometimes that learning process, especially for, for younger kids can take a little bit of time. So the last strategy I'd like to cover is how to teach kids to calm down. So this graph gives a visualization of what a tantrum or another emotional crisis looks like. Uh, so at some point there's a trigger that leads to agitation. If the issue is not resolved, your child will continue to escalate until uh, he or she reaches the peak of, trans, uh, of the tantrum, at which point he or she starts to deescalate and then to calm down. So kids with PWS can are very talented at escalating quickly from uh, the trigger all the way to the peak. And it can sometimes take a very long time for them to deescalate back into the recovery phase. So why are tantrums more prevalent in PWS? So we touched on this a little bit earlier, but essentially lots of kids with PWS might struggle to communicate effectively. And this can, this can either be because your, your child has a speech delay or speech, speech apraxia, but even if they have good language skills, sometimes they can struggle to effectively communicate what they need. Uh, and kids also experience consistent frustration and low success on tasks due to the fine and the gross motor deficits. So you combine this with impulsivity and uh, difficulty de-escalating and regulating your emotions and you have tantrums. So there are two times to intervene in tantrums, um, during the agitation phase and during the acceleration phase. So uh, the agitation phase is kind of right after that trigger when you're seeing a little bit of whining and crying. And then the acceleration phase is when you have tried to resolve the issue and you were not able to resolve the issue and now your child's escalating. So during the agitation phase, we're looking uh, to prevent escalation further using either communication or using calming skills. So this can include um, functional communication or other calming, or, or I'm sorry, functional communication and calming strategies such as um, counting backwards, breathing, hand tracing, 
uh, or some other physical activity, some things like stress balls, pushing on the wall, kind of depends on your child and what, what works best for them. So I would try a couple of different strategies. And then the acceleration phase presents the opportunity to practice regulating emotions in a safe way without worrying about getting in trouble. And I call this a calming break or a, a self-calming session, whatever you want to call it is fine, uh, I, but I usually call it a calming break. So calming breaks are useful for uh, a couple of reasons. They give kids the space to learn to calm themselves down, absent of the involvement of anyone else. So kids with developmental disabilities, uh, not just with PWS, often have people intervening in their lives 24-7, so people are prompting and helping and otherwise facilitating whatever they're doing or trying to teach them whatever the skill is. The problem with that is that you're not always going to be able to stand next to your child and help them calm down in every single situation. So this is why it's imperative for them to develop independent skills. So the calming sessions lets kids have the space to feel those strong emotions without judgment. So it's perfectly okay and perfectly normal to feel those strong emotions. We just have to be able to, to control our behavior surrounding the emotions. So I always try to like remind people the emotion itself is not the problem. It's the behavior that's the problem. So we just have to teach a more appropriate behavior, a, a more appropriate way to handle the strong emotions. So also because of the way that the calming breaks are set up, it reduces the likelihood that kids are going to continue to escalate. Um, and then the, the calming breaks also give parents the opportunity to avoid giving into the tantrum or reinforcing the tantrum. And instead of doing that, they're able to make their kids really calming for the really proud of the calming process itself. So I can't express how enough how important it is for kids to receive praise and to be really proud of calming down. So often the language around tantrums and big emotions is focused on what kids did wrong and that tantrums are bad. Um, but if we flip the script and we consider that kids with PWS are truly struggling with these big emotions, they're not being bad. They're struggling with these big emotions. We can shift the focus away from the tantrum itself and emphasize, emphasize the work that they do in the de-escalation and the recovery phases. Pretty much, we're asking them to make a, make a big effort to handle those strong emotions and pretty much to get control of their uncooperative brains. So what does this look like? In preparation, choose a quiet, neutral location where your child is not going to be disturbed. There is nothing more frustrated than being walked in on uh, when you're upset. So make sure they're gonna have some privacy. If you've ever been upset at, at anybody, if they kept walking into the room that you were trying to calm yourself down in, that would not help you calm down whatsoever. So this should never be somewhere that they have previously been sent for timeout or because they were in trouble. I really want this space to feel safe and comfortable and to not have any associations with getting in trouble whatsoever. So then when a tantrum occurs, you're going to try your prevention strategies first. And then if this fails, you're gonna move on to the calming break. So these are the basic steps of the calming break. First, I want you to move your child to wherever the calm down spot is. Um, and for the calm down spot, just make it somewhere that's nice and comfortable to sit. And it's also fine for there to be some solitary activities there. Like it re really should be somewhere that's comfortable for them. And then um, I want you to, to validate their emotions to a certain degree. So for example, you can say something like, I can see how frustrated you are when you have to share with your sister, or I can see how annoying it is when your brother um, turns off your TV show. And then you can let them know um, that you can't help them when they're that worked up. So you're just gonna give them a little bit of space to calm down. So all the language around this is like validating their experience, but also setting the limit that there's nothing that I can do for you when you're this upset. So um, then, so your child can do whatever they want in the, the uh, calming space. They can read, they can play with their beads, they can do whatever they want, as long as it's a safe and a solitary, um, 
activity. And you want to make sure when you pick that calming space that it's, of course, somewhere that's safe, nowhere that they can walk out the door or put themselves in danger so that you can let them be in this space and have a little bit of, um, of quiet time and independence without having to stand right next to them. Of course, you're going to supervise, you're going to be close, but make sure it's somewhere that, that they can be safe. Then you're going to give them a, a timer, but you have a little bit of a choice how you do this. You can either wait until your child stops uh, crying and give them the timer, or you can give it to them right, right away. I recommend just trying it both ways and seeing what your child prefers. Some kids really like it if you just give them the timer and let them go off by themselves. And some kids need uh, need you to wait for them to de-escalate enough to even be able to, to handle and watch that timer. So make sure the timer's for around two to five minutes. Uh, younger kids usually need a little less time and older kids tend to need a little bit more. And you might just have to adjust this based on the time it takes your child to, to calm down. So if you notice you give a two minute timer and that doesn't work, try a four minute timer and see how that goes. But the goal is that by the end of the timer that they're calm. And you might have to repeat this a couple of times, uh, especially the first time while they're getting the hang of it, and that's totally okay. The, the biggest thing you wanna remember is when they finally calm down, no matter how long it takes, I don't care if it, you have to reset the timer 20 times and it takes them an hour the first time, provide specific praise and a lot of praise about how well they did. So you can say, oh my gosh, you calmed down so quickly. I'm so proud of how you watched your timer. It doesn't matter what you say as long as you make a really big deal of it. So after the tantrum's over, uh, try to avoid discussing the tantrum itself. We want all the focus to be on how well your child calmed down. So you can keep finding opportunities to praise, for tell your spouse uh, in front of your child when they, can, when they come home how well your child did or get the older siblings in on uh, telling your child how well they did. It's also okay to rehearse uh, possible alternatives for the future. Like maybe it was the morning routine and the morning routine didn't go so well and that resulted in a tantrum. So you could practice what could go differently. And you can also practice the calming, str calming strategies, both the prevention strategies and the calming break when your child is calm. This is really helpful. If you're able to if you're able to, to help your child practice the skill when they're calm, that makes them that much more able when they do have a tantrum to be able to, to uh, use that skill if it's already in their repertoire. It's really, really hard to learn things when you're upset. So if you can practice when they're not upset, even better. All right, so what does this look like in real life? So now I just like to give you a couple of examples of how you could pull this all together so that these strategies are, are working with your child. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a couple of hypothetical examples with hypothetical children so you can see how this could somewhat be pulled together. So pretend that you have a five-year-old, boy or girl, doesn't matter, that's having a hard time with um, tantrums, defiance, and is very slow to start tasks when you ask them to do so or to complete tasks when, once they've started. So in this situation, you could uh, create a token system and you could use the token system to give reinforcement for transitions as well as for completing tasks and for following directions. And you would have to specify, like for example, you could specify all the tasks on your morning routine and they could earn tokens for that. So whatever routine is the most difficult. You could of course, could and should include the transition timers to help your child start the tasks um, and or switch from one task to another. And then also to help them know how much time they have to finish those tasks in a timely manner. So back to the let's race the timer. And then you could of course practice the tan tantrum prevention strategies and the calming breaks um, and use the like whenever possible solve the situation without saying anything, basic strategies like politely ignoring minor issues um, and avoiding those negative interactions whenever possible. So for a second example, let's just pretend that you have a 10 year old boy or girl who's struggling with skin picking repetitive asking and telling, um, and who insists on doing some routines in a very specific way, which sometimes makes um, him or her late to school or late to other activities. So in this situation, you could use a token system to reinforce keeping Band-Aids on and also not having any um, open wounds or sores. You could also um, 
set a new rule, like for example, mom and dad only answer questions twice, and then politely ignore if your child oversteps those boundaries so you can kind of avoid the power struggle related to that. You could also use transition timers to help your child to accelerate the transition off of those rigid routines into what needs to be done. Um, or to help them like shorten those, those routines for to a certain extent. Like for example, um, we have five more minutes, so let's let's finish dressing three more of our dolls and then we can go to school. So these are just a couple of very basic examples, but I hope that they can kind of help you to conceptualize how this would all be brought together for your child. Um, there are plenty of different ways to use these, these strategies as well as a lot more strategies that we could talk out about if we had enough time. Um, so just please feel free to reach out to me if you have specific questions about these, how these strategies could work for your child. So I'd now like to answer any questions that anyone has, but I'm also going to put up my contact information. So if I don't have time to answer your question today, please feel free to reach out to me over email or contact me through my website. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about um, ABA or anything else behavior related. Since I only had a brief time to cover these strategies and there were a lot more strategies that I wanted to cover, but I didn't have time for, um, I decided what I'm gonna do is to publish a different resource each week for parents that either talks about a specific topic, like talks about a specific behavior like skin picking or on another topic like potty training um, or that reviews one of these strategies in more detail or a different strategy in more detail. So if you're interested in these, just email me because I'm gonna just send them out to whoever's interested in them. Um, and then I also have some current existing resources on things like potty training and some other topics. So if you have any questions, just reach out. So I'm gonna put up my contact information and then I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Thank you, Casey, for a very informative session. Sure. Um, the slides will be on the hub uh, and can, also will be yeah, posted. Yeah, I can put slides on the hub. I have not posted it, but if that would be helpful, I'd be happy to. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, if you can put the slides up there, you can give them to info at uh, PWSA USA and they will be able to get that for you. I can um, do that. Up, and then they will also, the recording and uh, will be on the website in about a week or so. All right, so we're going to start with questions. Um, so the first question is, is what age can you start ABA therapy? That's a good question. Uh, so with kids with autism, they tend to start, you can start ABA, ABA therapy very early just because of the, especially the communication issues. I would say that really for kids with PWS, they don't always have those same communication issues that kids with autism has. So that's very dependent on your child and what your child's struggling with. I would say that if regardless of the age, if you feel like your kid's missing certain skills, like you're, you're seeing tantrums or you're seeing a specific skill deficit, that's a good time to at least go out and get an assessment. Uh, and in regards to, to school, the sooner you can get a behavior therapist involved, in my opinion, even if your child isn't having major behavior problems, the better, because they can put a lot of those systems of reinforcement in place to help prevent problem behavior and to help support your kid through all the difficult stuff that they're going to have to do in school. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have two other ones in regards to picking. Uh, there is, do you have any strategies for stopping anal picking? Picking? Um, it's pretty severe in regards to hospital and physical part is taken care of, but they keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And the other one is just regular skin picking. Um, do you either use tokens or something else? Right. So, so for the, the rectal picking, definitely look at any potential med medical variables. If you have not already, a lot of times there's some type of physical discomfort going on, whether that's constipation or some gastro gastrointestinal issue. That's not the case in every every person, but I always like to rule that out first. Or there's some issues of cleanliness, like the person is just generally itchy and uncomfortable because they're not engaging in appropriate self-care skills. And then you, there are plenty of strategies that you can use from, for rectal picking, going from like functional communication training to, uh, to just reinforcement and supervision. 
it's a little bit of a complicated question to answer in like two minutes. So if you send me an email, I can definitely help you with that. So I can tell you what I've done that's work, worked in the past and I can help you figure out what, more, what might work better for your kid. Uh, as far as the skin picking, I, out, I love token systems for skin picking. Uh, I usually focus on reinforcing keeping band-aids on because a lot of times the picking is unconscious. So your, your, your kid, they're, they're bored, they're stressed, they're in bed doing nothing and you don't think about it. You just pick it, the itchy, annoying scab. So I, I usually reinforce a combination of um, keeping band-aids on or keeping, if it's a, an area that doesn't respond well to a band-aid like in your head or on your face, keeping some type of super moisturizing lotion like the aquifer wound ointment or something like that to prevent the itching. Um, so reinforcing keeping both those things on there and then also reinforcing the absence of wounds over time. And you usually have to start giving a whole lot of reinforcement because it, this behavior is reinforcing in and of itself. Like something is itchy and annoying and you want to pick it. So you have to really, really try to motivate your, your kids to try to work on that. But if you get the reinforcers right, kids can 100% stop picking and 100% clear up all those wounds. So it's definitely doable. You just have to get the system right. Thank you. Um, great presentation. How do we start ABA therapy? I've heard that you need to have an autism diagnosis to be able to meet that criteria. That's a great question. So in most states, they will require you to have an autism diagnosis to get ABA therapy. I will give you the caveat that ABA therapy that is traditionally given to kids with autism is not always completely appropriate for kids with PWS just because of the difference in, in necess like the skill deficits and what they need to be taught. Um, ABA therapy for kids with PWS is a lot more helpful if it's done in the home versus in the, the clinic setting, especially if your kid's not having too many skill deficits or behavior problems. So it's really gotta be a very individualized system. You can almost always access ABA therapy in school, even if you can't access it. If you don't have an autism diagnosis, probably you can't access it in a clinic setting, but you can probably access it in school, especially if you're noticing any behavior problems that you feel like are interfering with your child's ability to earn. You can definitely request a, a um, functional behavior assessment in your IEP, and that's a good way to start accessing strategies. Also, even if you don't have an ABA therapist working with you directly, there are plenty of parent training programs out there and parent training resources where you can use some of these strategies at home. So it can help you out, out a little bit at home and then you can also get the support at school. So usually some combination of those things can be really helpful for kids with PWS, even if you can't get it in a clinic setting. Thank you. What is hand tracing? Hand tracing, it's just a calming strategy for little kids who don't want to count or whatever. If you can get them to, to just trace their hand with their finger. <laughs> That's all it is. Sometimes that little bit of sensory input can help them to hijack their brain back if their brain's kind of get trying to get out of control on them. So there's lots of different things that that people teach kids. Some some people teach them like tapping. Some people teach them hand tracing. Uh, I can send you some resources on that, but that's all it is. Exactly what it sounds like. Thank you. Um, how can we or um fade token economies? Um, That's a really good question. And Was where that? does intrinsic motivation come from? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great question. So the way to fade token economies, if your token system is working really well and your kid is earning all the reinforcers like at least 80% of the time, then you can either increase the requirement. Like for example, if you were just requiring them to to make a little bit of effort on a specific task. You can increase the effort that, that you need them to make, but if you have them doing everything exactly as you need them to do, then you can, uh, can require the same amount of work for a couple fewer tokens, or you can put your tokens on a random schedule. So instead of giving a token every single time they follow whatever the direction is, they can get the tokens on a random schedule. And then you, you give fewer and fewer tokens over time uh, until you're giving pretty much no tokens whatsoever. So that's how we fade it. And the question about intrinsic versus uh, like internal versus external motivation. The For kids with PWS, because life is so much more difficult for them, the external or the um, intrinsic motivation to engage in some of these tasks is not necessarily going to be there. 
And what we call intrinsic motivation, it, people call it intrinsic motivation, but all it is is whether or not that behavior is reinforcing to you. So whether or not you have the intrinsic motivation to go to the gym has nothing to do with you and has nothing to do with the gym. All it has to do with is, do you like exercise or don't you like exercise? It's the same thing for all these behaviors for, for kids with PWS. Whether or not you go to your yoga class depends on whether or not you like yoga. So if it's a difficult task where their kids don't have the intrinsic motivation to engage in that, that's where the token systems come in place. And it's less about creating the intrinsic motivation and more about teaching them the skills and building the skill repertoire to where whatever that task was really difficult before is now super easy now. So you don't need that external motivation in order to do it. Thank you. Um, how do we implement a behavior plan for group homes when lots of pressure by disability rights and advocates gaining influence in the state? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So I, were, I previously worked for six years in a residential uh, facility with people with PWS, and that is balancing a person's rights <laughs> and balancing their health and safety is always the biggest and toughest question. The way that I had the most success doing that was keeping every program very individualized and demonstrating through the behavior data why you needed a restriction for a specific person while also having a fading plan for that. So if I'm gonna tell you, you can't have access to this cell phone, I am going to demonstrate with your behavior data why you can't have access to the cell phone. And then I'm going to have a one year long step-by-step -step process of how you can start to earn that responsibility back. So, and in, in my experience with, with like rights committees, that works really well, especially if you're, you're not just saying, no, you can't have this. No, the food environment has to be locked 24 seven for the rest of your life, but I'm not gonna teach you any adaptive skills. If you have that skills training process where they can work to, towards a place where they could get access back or at least have a little bit more freedom, that tends to be the, the piece that works best, I think. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on current trends and practices in the use of drugs as an um, adjacent to other strategies to manage anxiety and related behaviors in PWS teenagers? So what I'll say about that is I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't comment. I won't comment on any specific drugs or anything related um, to that. There were some really good presentations by psychiatrists that you should definitely go and check out that kind of answered those questions. But um, behavior analysis service is always meant to be given in conjunction with other therapies. So this is never something I'm never going to say your kid doesn't need medication. They don't need OT. They don't need anything else. They don't need speech. They need all these things and all of these things need to work together. And behavior analysis gives a, a, a great foundation for how these therapies can all work together to, to be best for your kid. Something that, that ABA therapy can be very useful with when it comes to psychotropic medication is if you can get your provider involved in helping you monitor the effects of the medication so that you can communicate that, that to your prescriber. So if you're, if you're struggling with tantrums that you think are related to anxiety and you start trying a new medication, there's no reason you couldn't communicate that behavior data to your provider for before and after the change for them to be able to look at that and see if they think the changes they're making medication wise are really working. So I think that's a good way that behavior analysis and, and psychiatry can collaborate. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a bit about ethical guidelines surrounding token economies with adults or specifically how do you respond um, from hesitation from other stakeholders about the appropriateness? So I'm not sure what the question is regards and are you talking about the ethics of just delivering reinforcement in general or specific to token economies? I believe it's in regards to token economies because a lot of people believe that's an outdated practice is token economies. Sure. So the reason that I like token economies is because it lines up directly with the entire world's financial system. So if you think the, the token systems are, are outdated, then we probably have to, to evaluate a lot of things that we're doing in real life. I do agree that in certain situations, certain to token economy practices, especially if they're not remotely related to a specific adaptive skill, can be kind of pointless. Um, so if you're using if you're using a sticker chart with adults with developmental disabilities, that's completely inappropriate. But if you have a token system within the home that is teaching budgeted skills, budgeting skills and money management skills, as well as contributing to helping teach adaptive skills, 
that I think could be appropriate. So I think there's, there are definitely legitimate concerns about ways to use token systems. And I think we need to make sure that whatever we're doing is age appropriate and also teaching whatever the skills are that we're looking to teach. Thank you. Uh, what to do when older PWS clients uh, escalate problem behaviors when trying to go to a calming space? So when, like, depending on who you're working with, you have to break this down into very, very small steps. So if you have an, an a, if your, your child is an adult who's having a lot of problem behavior, we would have to break the, the calming process down into micro steps if you don't, especially if you don't have the support to, to help them out when they escalate to dangerous behavior. So that's another one that without knowing the specific situation is it's very difficult for me to guide you on how to break that down. So send me an email and I'll definitely help you fig that, figure that out. It's doable for every person. You just have to figure out what works for that person and you have to break it down into small enough steps. Thank you. If social behaviors are the current treatment goals for your child with ABA, how would you suggest incorporating social interactions from school with ABA therapy at home? Okay, so you have ABA therapy at home and then you're asking how to, uh, to translate that into the school setting. That's a good question. Um, in my experience, schools are really willing to collaborate with in-home ABA therapists. So it would probably be a good idea to ask your ABA therapist if they would attend the IEP meeting with you because they can give you a lot of support in that regards. And the best thing usually to do is to get those social skills goals aligned with whatever's in the IEP. And then whatever, if your child has any additional supports at the school, whether it's a, a paraprofessional or special ed, or even if your child's in a general ed class with just somebody who comes in and assists the kids with special needs, they if it's an IEP goal, they have to work on it. So figuring out what appropriate measurable IEP goals are with your ABA provider and then taking those to the school is, is usually the best choice. All right, I think that's it for our questions today. Uh, thank you everybody. If you could please make sure that you complete your survey uh, that is in your links up on the side. It helps us plan for our future conferences. So thank you everybody. And thank you Casey for a very informative and uh, great presentation.